Um, hello, everybody. Uh, so yeah, uh, I work at Cockroach Labs as an SRE, um, and we we built CockroachDB, this distributed SQL database, and also Cockroach Cloud, this database as a service built on top. And uh, we built the database as a service on top of Kubernetes. Um, we've been in beta since around November, and we have 70 production clusters. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, we didn't always use Kubernetes. I want to tell you a bit about how we decided to use Kubernetes, why we use Kubernetes, what the experience has been like running this database as a service on Kubernetes. So agenda, uh, first, just a little bit about what a managed service is, what the requirements for a managed service are. Um, then we're going to talk a bit about CockroachDB, and the reason we're going to do that is because there are some kind of, there are some important production requirements that are specific to CockroachDB. They mainly have to do with the network. And those complicate running CockroachDB on Kubernetes. And that's kind of the core, like technical meat of this talk. Then after that, a little bit about how we did things before we had Kubernetes. We were in Alpha for a while, not using Kubernetes. Then um, why we decided to use Kubernetes and how that went. Um, and then wrap up with some lessons learned. So uh, this is our Cockroach Cloud UI today. Um, what this lets you do is you log in, you uh, put in your credit card information, you make some choices, you say what cloud you want to run in, what cloud region you want, how many nodes you want, um, and then you click create cluster and 20 minutes or so later, you get a Cockroach DB cluster which you can use. Um, and so this, when we talk about a managed service, like this is what we're building, something that, something that lets you do this. Um, uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about the requirements. There's kind of two buckets of requirements that are important for this talk. Um, one bucket has to do with making it really easy to orchestrate things. So we wanna be able to create clusters quickly for our users when they want them. If a user wants extra compute, we want to be able to scale the cluster really simply from the UI also. We want to be able to recover from certain kinds of transient failures. We want to be able to do upgrades. The, the software running. A lot of the things that we're trying to do are have to do with orchestration. We want to be able to do lots of different orchestration tasks very easily from our managed service so that the managed service is good for our customers. And then the other bucket is this networking bucket, and that's the one that we're going to talk about more, more later. There are some networking requirements that make running on Kubernetes kind of complicated and interesting, and so we're, we're tracking that with a network. So now a little bit about Cocker HGB, and the reason we're going to do this is because we want to understand the production requirements that make it complicated to run on Kubernetes. So some background, Docker is a distributed SQL database. Uh, what this means is you get benefits of a SQL database, you get acid transactions, the relational model, um, but you also get the benefits of a distributed database or a NoSQL database. You get horizontal scalability. If you want more, more compute, you just add more nodes. Um, and also high availability and durability because the data is going to be like replicated, stored in multiple places. Um, and if, if one goes down, that's not going to cause a problem for the users. So here's the simplest architecture diagram for a distributed deployment. There's um, each node, the nodes are symmetric. So the nodes can both respond to user requests um, and store data. And in this case, there's three nodes and data by default is replicated three way. So the data is stored on all these nodes. Um, and the nodes are all talking to each other because uh, consensus algorithms in our case raft are running across them in order to keep the data, the replicated data consistent. Just add one more thing to this picture, a load balancer so that we can um, send uh, get user requests into the cluster. So this is the simplest picture but it can get more complex so you can run GB in a multi 
you regeode, you use injects uh, because of the loss of a region. So you, you have high availability requirements. Another reason you might want to do this is for latency reasons. Maybe you want to locate data close to the user to use that data, um, possibly for latency reasons, also possibly for regulatory reasons. But, but anyway, you can run Cockroach to be in this mode. In this case, there's three regions. There's US West, US East, and SA East. Um, but the cluster is one, like logically. Um, so what's interesting about this is the networking requirement. So the, the nodes, they need, um, they need direct node to node access to some stable uh, region setup that can be kind of complex. And especially when it that can be complex, and, and that's what we'll get into soon. So uh, we didn't always use Kubernetes. Initially, we have a simpler product, uh, and I want to just talk a little bit about that and I decided what to for So the simple production is actually just for this pair. So we would use our form to spin up VMs. Um, and then we would, we had some Go code, some kind of scripty Go code that would go and load the Cocker GB binary on each VM. Um, and it would keep it running with supervisor. So this was a very simple. Hmm. I don't see myself. Hi, Josh. Sorry, I, I had to stop your video because we're you're having some connectivity issues and we just want to make sure the audio comes uh, okay. Sounds comes good. clearly. Sorry okay. about that. No, no. All good. Thanks. Um, so uh, so yeah, so so this terraform setup, very simple. Um, we we create a VM Cocker V directly on the VMs. Um, the networking is pretty simple because we're using GCP and AWS networking. GCP provides a global VPC by default. So how does this this approach do with our list of requirements? Uh, it does okay. Uh, we can create clusters. Um, we can scale them. We can upgrade them. It's a little toily though. So if you want to create a cluster, you have to run Terraform. Terraform is going to produce some JSON output. Um, and then that you're going to pipe into this Go script we wrote that's going to load the binary um, on those VMs. Doable, but, but toily and kind of slow and, and require an SRE to be there because if a VM was to die, the VM might get spun up again by GCP or fixed by GCP, but it wouldn't be running Cocker GB and an SRE would need to be need to involve themselves manually in order to fix that. The network on the other hand, will give a green. The networking is very simple and it's gonna get more complicated when we're on Kubernetes, which is why we're, we're mentioning that. So uh, the reason though that we decided that this approach wasn't good enough was because what we really wanted was a self-service product. What we really want is this. We want this website where you can go log in, um, choose a cloud, choose a cloud region, choose a number of nodes, put in your credit card, hit create, 20 minutes later you get a cluster or, or faster. Um, and uh, that's not what our alpha product was. What our alpha product was, was you would kind of send an email to our sales team, to our product manager. They would agree on what kind of cluster to create for you. The product manager would open a ticket on the SRE team. And then one business day later, the SRE team would go and create the cluster. So what we really want is this. And, and the self-service requirement is, is the one that led us to really think strongly about using Kubernetes. So we're gonna add a requirement to our list. Uh, what we want is a service that does these orchestration tasks. And given that we want this, what we really want is easy to use APIs that let us do orchestration tasks. Um, and that's not really like what Terraform and our Go scripty approach gives you. So we're going to give that a red. Like it's not easy to orchestrate from a service. And this is what led us to consider Kubernetes because we know that Kubernetes has these really great APIs. Uh, you declare what you want Kubernetes to run, and then it handles all the low-level details. 
So now let's think about how Kubernetes does and let's speak more specifically about that. Okay, so rolling updates. This is exactly the kind of thing that we love about Kubernetes. We send a single kubectl command or a single API call and Kubernetes will do a rolling update even of a stateful application like ours. Um, and it will do health checks. It will, you can choose how much risk you take, how fast you go. This is the kind of stuff that like our SRE team doesn't want to rebuild and so we'd rather use Kubernetes. Scaling might seem like it would be just as easy. There are some edges though that are kind of interesting. So um, we're running one Kubernetes cluster for each of our customers, like dedicated to that customer. Doing that for isolation reasons, security reliability reasons, we're, we're, we're not tied to that for all of time, but that's currently our model. Um, so what this means is that when we, when a customer wants to scale up a cockroach cloud cluster, we actually have to do two things. First, we have to scale up the node pool or the instance group via direct API calls to the cloud provider. And then after that, we go and scale the actual stateful set. So this is easy enough, but it's a little more complicated. It's, it's also worth mentioning that we support GCP and AWS right now. So we like just sending Kubernetes API calls because those are independent of cloud. But in this case, we have to go and actually talk to the cloud provider directly. And also this complexity has led to some interesting bugs that we've hit. Um, it's actually had an effect on the reliability of our databases of service platform. So the bug, the symptom of the bug is that we would, we would scale up, we would attempt to scale up a cluster. There'd be a VM with available resources and there'd be a persistent volume, uh, spun up a new persistent volume, but they'd be in different zones. And so the new Cockroach V pod that we were attempting to schedule, would it schedule? The first time we hit this bug, the cause was wait for first consumer was uh, not set. Um, and this is, you know, kind of a strange edge in my opinion that, that you have to set this field, uh, but we set it. And then the second time we hit, we hit it, it was, even more interesting, it was, it was a race condition. So what would happen is we'd scale the instance group and then we'd immediately scale the stateful set. Um, but we wouldn't wait before scaling the stateful set to make sure that Kubernetes was aware of the new VM that in the list of nodes that Kubernetes is aware of was this VM. And because of that, uh, the persistent volume would be spun up in the wrong zone and it would stay spun up in the wrong zone because Kubernetes is not going to go and remove a persistent volume after the fact because that's kind of sketchy. So yeah, we hit this bug twice. It was, it was a fun one. So how is Kubernetes doing on our list of requirements? It's doing pretty well. Um, use via APIs green, that's really important given our, our, our goals. Creating clusters is pretty easy. Upgrading clusters is easy. Uh, Kubernetes, the model means that transient failures are kind of naturally recovered from. Scaling will give a yellow because there's some complexity, but still it's doable. The big question mark is the network. And let, let's talk about that more now. So before we even talk about the multi-region networking, um, it's worth pointing out that just Kubernetes networking is very complicated in general. There are these pod IPs, the node IPs, the service IPs. If you're running a production service on Kubernetes, you kind of have to keep these things in your head and less in case something breaks. Um, and there was a lot of talk on our SRE team about whether the complexity was worth taking on and how much the complexity would cost us. But it gets a lot more complicated when we're talking about multi-region networking specific to Cockroach Cloud. So CockroachDB, it can uh, run across regions like we mentioned. Kubernetes, on the other hand, is designed to be run in a specific region um, only. Uh, and then CockroachDB has this last requirement, which is that there's no full node-to-node -node connectivity via some stable network identity. So the question is, how can we, use, how can we run a multi-region CockroachDB cluster on multiple independent Kubernetes clusters, one per region the customer wants to run in, while still maintaining our node-to-node -node connectivity requirement. Kubernetes does it 
give you an answer to this. We had to kind of think of something ourselves with help from certain Kubernetes experts. So our approach here we call uh, DNS chaining. Uh, the stateful set provides a stable network identity in the form of DNS names. When I say stable, what I mean is that like crdb one dot us east one, um, that uh, that that network identity is a tat is is linked to a specific persistent disk, and it will remain linked to that persistent disk like across restarts. And the stateful set just provides these stable network identities. But the thing is, the Kubernetes DNS service is only accessible from within that Kubernetes DNS service, or sorry, from within that Kubernetes cluster. So the question is, how can we expose it more broadly? What we do is we use a service of type load balancer to expose the Kubernetes DNS service externally. Uh, and then we configure Kubernetes DNS to proxy DNS lookups for nodes in other regions to the load balancers that we just spun up. So I can show a picture of this, which I think will make it clearer. So here we have a multi-region cluster again. We have two additions to this picture. We have um, the, the green box is the Kubernetes DNS service uh, for each region. And then the load balancer attached to it is the external load balancer spun up via creating a service of type load balancer. So if a node in US West wants to talk to a node in, um, in the other region, then what it's going to do is it's going to send a request to its DNS serv its Kubernetes DNS service, the one in, in, in the cluster. That's going to proxy that request to the DNS load balancer for this other region. That load balancer will, will route the request to the DNS service for that region. That's going to respond with an IP address. And then that IP address is routable um, given the way that GCP VPCs work. So the network, we're going to give a yellow. Um, this is workable. Uh, we've we've been we've been running multi-region clusters like this for since November. We haven't hit any production issues caused by this approach, um, and we believe it would scale to the kind of to the level of usage that that, that we expect. But it's it's fairly complicated. It's fairly custom. Um, it required a fair amount of thought, and so so we'll give that a yellow. Yeah, so um, what we've learned. So we've been running Kubernetes, Cockroach Cloud on Kubernetes since November. Overall, we've, we've been really happy with Kubernetes. We haven't hit any big production issues caused by Kubernetes or anything like that. Um, and I just wanna think a little bit now about different reasons why a group of people might wanna use Kubernetes and, and how those apply to like this story about our specific managed service. So, okay, so why would you use Kubernetes in general? There's a few different reasons, and in my head, at least, these reasons were kind of like meshed together until I worked on this project, and then I was like, oh, there's actually different reasons you might want to use it. So one reason is that you want to bin pack a very heterogeneous set of workloads onto a single pool of compute. You might want to do this for efficiency reasons because, uh, because that bin packing can be efficient and, and it use up all the resources on those nodes. Or maybe you're looking more to create kind of a consistent production platform where an SRE team runs the big pool of compute, runs the Kubernetes cluster, and then a bunch of different developer teams uh, can just deploy whatever workloads they want onto that single pool of compute. So this region, reason is not why we're using Kubernetes. We don't really care about bin packing. For the most part, we want to run um, one cockroach DB node per physical VM or per VM. Um, so that benefit isn't really very significant for us. And there's a lot of complexity that comes out of that bin packing. Like a lot of the networking complexity kind of comes out of the fact that you're running all these different um, workloads on a single VM. What we're really looking to use Kubernetes for is to get access to these really solid automation primitives. And that's really why we considered it. We knew we had to do a lot of orchestration and we know that Kubernetes provides really solid, solid base for building those orchestrations. But what's interesting is 
we, we've kind of realized that, that there's more to this. So this is running kubectl get all um, on a uh, cockroach cloud cluster today. And what you see is a mix of things. You see some things that we knew we'd run. We knew we'd run pod cockroach db-0 on these clusters um, from the beginning. That's cockroach db. We're obviously going to run that. And we also knew we'd run the backupper, for example. But we didn't know we'd run the HA proxy or the SQL prober. The HA proxy is providing metric access for SREs. The SQL prober is sending black box probes to CockroachDB to measure the reliability of the database. And these are things that over time we realized we needed. And this continues to be the case. And we, well, one thing we really like about Kubernetes is that by using it, we maintain a lot of flexibility and, and we can deploy new things to it later on without having to change our actual infrastructure. And we think that's really powerful. And we weren't really totally thinking about that benefit when we when we initially adopted it, but that's been that's been very big for us. So we're going to add that as a reason. Kubernetes is this very flexible production platform, and that allows us to evolve the production stack in all these directions we didn't see. Like another example of this that's even more significant, perhaps, is initially we were running one Kubernetes cluster per customer. Um, but we've realized that for cost reasons, we want to do something more multi-tenant and by using Kubernetes, that becomes like totally possible. So we'll add evolve as an option, as a requirement, and then we'll give Kubernetes a green for that. Okay, uh, that's, that's what I have. Thank you very much for listening to my talk about Cockroach Cloud running on Kubernetes. Um, I'm happy to ask, answer any questions. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Not that I can see at the moment. Uh, I, I have a couple questions. Cool. Um, so this is a follow up to a question that I asked you last year. Um, <laughs> And uh, it's very much the same question, maybe you'll remember. Um, so last year, uh, Kubernetes Federation, which if you don't know, is, is uh, uh, a component that allows two Kubernetes clusters, potentially in different regions, to federate together. Um, it had been dropped completely, and uh, Federation V2 had been started. Um, so. Now Federation V2 is in alpha, obviously it's not production ready, um, but do you have any plans to uh, replace your DNS chaining with sort of an official Kubernetes primitive or are you satisfied with the, the performance and the, uh, the sort of SRE cost of running DNS chaining? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm gonna just try to re-enable your video and see if... Uh, Unfortunately, yeah, I'm in New Hampshire and it's it's very rural. <laughs> okay. Um, you look choppy. Let's see how you sound. I'll, I'll, if if you disappear, it's because I disabled it again. Yeah, got it. Okay, sounds good. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So I don't think we're attached to our current approach. Um, we we built it because that's what we thought was the best approach at the time. Um, we don't have specific problems with it right now. Um, I, I think the motivation for moving to a more standard approach would be simplifying, simplifying it more than fixing like a specific issue with the approach, such as like a reliability issue. Um, and, and we definitely are interested in that, uh, but we don't have like a concrete plan um, to look into that right now. Is there a significant time investment in managing the networking now that it's all sort of set up or is it kind of plug and play at this point? It's kind of plug and play. I, I think, I, I think like for us, since we're a managed service provider, it's not that, that it doesn't really have a, like an ongoing cost because we, we've built it, it's sitting and we don't really touch it and it doesn't really change and it doesn't really break. Um, but we have a lot of customers that run Cockroach DB on Kubernetes that, that are, that are doing it in the self-hosted style. And it would be really great if running a multi-region CockroachDB cluster on Kubernetes was easy for them. And I, I think that 
the DNS training approach is not easy for anyone like that. So I, I, that's definitely a, a motivating reason to look at other approaches, make it easy for, for everyone to do what, what we're doing. Cool. Thanks. Um, one other question. Um, so in your, your first sort of most simple diagram, you showed three instances of cockroach running together and the uh, multi-region diagram showed sort of three of those clusters all interconnected with each other. I was wondering how you manage um, how you manage your data versus like in terms of uh, deduplication, sharding, that kind of stuff in order to make sure that, you know, if you have a very large database that uh, you can communicate efficiently and also like how that factors into disaster recovery, HA, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so the customer has a certain amount of control over this. Basically, the, a simple mental model is that we're trying to store each piece of data in three places by default. And we're trying to store them in places that lead, by default, we're storing them in places that lead to the best outcomes in terms of disaster recovery. So, for example, we're not going to store three pieces of data in the same availability zone. We're going to store them in three separate availability zones. Um, and then a the customer can come in and um, if they're more interested in reducing latencies instead of surviving a regional outage, for example, they can um, they can rework their schema to kind of uh, signal that. And then we might store data, we might store all of the copies of a data in a specific region in order to improve latencies, but while still keeping the copies on different availability zones. So there's kind of this balance between give customer control in order to kind of say what 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 your goal is. Are you do you care about performance? Do you care about availability? While also making while also doing a lot of it automatically. Cool. So so default is safety, but it allows you to to jack up performance if if that's your biggest concern. Yeah, and a lot of multi-region use cases of Cockroach DB are about like locating data close to users. So that's quite common. And how many, roughly how many clusters or customers are you serving with your cloud? We have 70, around 70 production clusters right now. Cool. Yeah. And, and have you seen any like major challenges as you scale up from, you know, one or two POC customers to 70? Yeah, I feel like I could give like a four hour talk on that question. <laughs> well, we um, have a few minutes left. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, they're not really about Kubernetes though. I mean, we, we have, we run into like, like when we built the scaling feature, we hit certain kind of edges with Kubernetes and things like that. But um, our production issues more have to do with just the difficulties of running a distributed SQL database. Um, the main production issue we have right now is sometimes our clusters run out of memory uh, for a variety of reasons. And, you know, we fix the specific bug, but we find different future bugs that are not the same bug, but kind of similar. There's kind of a pattern to them. Uh, and so that's something that the SRE team is definitely like working on a lot right now. Okay. So we've got a question in the chat from Dan Wilson. Uh, Dan asks, in the multi-region cluster configuration, is TLS provided by Cockroach or by the cloud provider networking? Uh, yeah, it is provided uh, by Cockroach. Um, so, so we're not using any like fancy SDOE thing where the TLS is provided, but not by Cockroach. We're relying on Cockroach to provide the TLS. And in the cloud platform, we are certainly running TLS, yes. Cool. Uh, we have another question in the chat from Andreas Schmidt. Uh, he wants to know if you can remember an aspect where Terraform was better than Kubernetes. I mean, yeah, uh, I think like we're paying complexity costs in order to get orchestration um, like leverage. Uh, so the complexity costs we're paying are the networking is more complicated by a lot. Um, also, sometimes the orchestration can be kind of complicated. Um, I, I think like for us, the, the benefits way outweigh the, the cons, but um, I, I, the most concrete problem with, uh, with our Kubernetes deploy deployments compared to our Terraform deployments is the complexity of the network stack. Cool. 
Um, and Martin Borgman, uh, sorry if I mispronounced that, wants to know if you considered solutions like Gardner to manage your clusters. Uh, no, we, I don't know about Gardner. We, we did consider other things. Um, part of the reason that we used Kubernetes is also that a lot of our customers that aren't running in the cloud offering run on Kubernetes. And so we want it to be really easy to run Cocker GB on Kubernetes. Do you have any customers running OpenShift? Um, I bet you we do, but as an SRE, I'm very like focused on the managed service and I don't know for sure. Sure. Um, one other question. So if, if you've been using Kubernetes for a while, I'm sure you've heard uh, never run a database workload on Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, it's been said by, you know, Kelsey Hightower, uh, yeah. Chris Nova, all of the sort of thought leaders in the space. Um, yeah. Can you speak to what makes Cockroach Labs uh, offering different and more suitable to running in Kubernetes? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, I, I, I wonder if a lot of those comments, I think the stateful set abstraction is like a pretty strong one at this point. Mm -hmm. um, we've had no problems that came out of like that abstraction. And that abstraction like lines up really well with running Cockroach GB, which is this distributed SQL database where you need to, you know, through restarts, always be attaching to the same persistent disk. Yeah, um, I, I don't think stateful sets were in GA when, when people were saying that, so. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. sense. And also like another, I think difference is if I was working on an application and the application wanted to depend on a, a self-hosted version of Cockroach GB, I don't know if, I mean, I would consider running it on Kubernetes, but there's a lot of complexity that you're taking on by doing that right now, we're, which we're working on making it a lot easier, but at least right now there's a fair amount of complexity. Um, sure. But that's not our situation. Like we're running a managed service. So sure, there's complexity in running the managed service on Kubernetes, but like we can pay, we can deal with the complexity because that's like the core thing that the company, that, that the SREs are doing. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think this plays into the whole, um, that technically anyone can write an operator, right? Build, build CRDs for, for applications, but it's really more about uh, the level of expertise. If you're writing an operator without the requisite expertise to deliver it, then you're going to have problems, right? So I think it's the same with uh, distributed uh, databases. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah, and and who better to write an operator than the people who wrote the database? Bingo. <laughs> right. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, very very big thank you to Josh. Uh, thank really. You. Uh, yeah, and uh, just as good, if not better, than last year. So thank you very much. <laughs>